I just don't know how many tattooers we need where it's just, you know, another person tracing a Greek or Roman statue and applying it verbatim. That's pretty boring to me. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Books Closed. I am Andrew Stortz. Before we get started, whether this is your 50th or your first time here with me today, please make sure that you're subscribed, that you're thumbs upping, you're liking, you're leaving five-star reviews, all that good stuff. It's a little corny of me to ask, but you know what? It helps new people find the show, and it helps to also make sure that you don't miss future episodes yourself. Today, you're going to get to hear a conversation I had with a tattooer whose work I've admired for many years, Zach Spurlock. I was able to go down to his beautiful studio, Kudzu Tattoo, in Savannah, Georgia, which is one of my favorite places to visit. It's a city built upon the dead, they say, and if you've never been there, you should definitely check it out. Go see Zach. This episode was made possible by my sponsors, Tattoo Dream, Doss M, Black Dagger Books, and Equal Vision Records, so thank you to all of them, and I will tell you about each of them a little bit later. But for now, I'll throw it over to Zach Spurlock. This week's a very special episode because we're in my favorite place ever, Savannah, Georgia, and we're with one of the coolest dudes in tattooing, Zach Spurlock. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I've been excited to get you on the show for a while. I think it's been a long time coming, but I haven't seen you in a little bit, maybe a year or two, I guess. Yeah, something like that on the guest spot. Yeah. I love Savannah. You've been in Savannah for a while, right? Yeah, it's been 20 years now. See, I feel like I know you, but I don't really know anything about you. So I'm using this as an opportunity to ask the questions that I feel like I should probably know on a personal level, but I really don't. So where did you grow up? I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. It's about two hours away from here. So as far as tattoo life, has that all been in Savannah or where did that start? The majority of it, yeah, uh, because it was illegal in Charleston, South Carolina when I was growing up. So it wasn't until I got uh, to college and I started venturing outside of the state lines to try to find a tattoo shop that, that wound up working out for me. Where did that lead you? Uh, the first, first tattoo attempts were Florida. Me and my friend, instead of doing the uh, prom in high school, <laughs> we went down to Orlando. We took some fake IDs and we wound up venturing into some tattoo shops. We got some terrible tattoos from some... Really gross Florida shops. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that was a story that a lot of people could tell that were in and around Florida at that time, and maybe even still. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, some things never change for sure. <laughs> I wonder, is that by design? Is it just because Florida is so touristy? Or what's up with Florida? Uh, good things and bad things. There's great shops in Florida. I need you to answer for the entire state of Florida right now and, and state the case. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, Florida's, Florida's got some characters for sure. It's a good place to get stabbed. Okay. Tight. Yeah. The, uh, the first shop that we went into, um, we had, we had our fake IDs and, uh, the, the guys thought that we were in the military. We had our heads shaved and he's like, come on back boys. You're good. Come on back. So we didn't even really need the IDs. We, we weren't even. 18 yet, and they, they invited us back. <laughs> they showed us the real ways of Florida. <laughs> nice. Yeah, all you need is a haircut and, uh, and a piece of skin, and you are fucking in. That's right. That's right. That's how we did it. I was getting tattooed, and uh, I asked him what the door was in the very back, and he said, oh, that connects to the bait and tackle shop that's next door. <laughs> <laughs> One-stop shop, I guess. Get some worms, hepatitis. <laughs> A couple of straight edge tats. We're good to go. <laughs> That's what's up. <laughs> so last time I saw you, and this is what really made me want to have you on the show. You told me some great stories about your development as an artist and your education in art school. Yeah. And a teacher you had. So from a, from a humble, young, head shaved, straight edge kid getting tattooed and getting their bait and tackle in Florida, you find yourself in art school. <laughs> Where did you end up in art school? Where did that happen? Uh, it was University of South Carolina in Columbia. Um, and I, I, I did go for fine arts for painting. Yeah. Tattooing wasn't on the radar for something that you'd want to do at that point, or was it? Uh, it definitely was. It just it cost so much money to even just get out of town to even be near a tattoo shop. 
that, that sort of seemed like trying to figure out how to go to the moon. So being in Columbia, that was about an hour away from the state line. So once I got into college, that's where I started really kind of pursuing an actual route to get into tattooing. I found a shop called Immortal Images eventually. And there was a guy there, Steve Huntsberry. And he, he, he was one of the coolest guys that I had met in any of the tattoo shops, like kind of comparing it in between Florida and home tattooers. Um, this guy was, you know, he had motorcycles, he had pit bulls in the shop, but he was really patient and courteous and, and sweet to some kids coming in there. So he kind of changed my idea about what tattooing could be. You know, he was sort of a, he was sort of like a tough guy, but he was just sweet, patient. Do you think that without meeting him, maybe your ability to find an opportunity or an avenue in could have been different? Because I feel like some people just meet the right person and otherwise uh, it may not have happened. I, I think about my own experience where if, uh, if, had I not found the opportunity that I did, I don't know if I would have been able to to find a way into tattooing for myself. Oh yeah, he was he was integral for sure. Um, he he was the guy that sort of he kind of changed my thinking about what a tattoo shop was. He was the first guy who was kind of treating us like we were humans. So that's where I started bringing in some artwork and trying to get my friends tattooed and showing them some drawings I had done and. I mean, I was so excited about tattooing, about just being in there, that I think that was even kind of stressing him out. And as I was kind of asking him about the route to get into tattooing, you know, he kind of just reminded me to take it easy, take it slower. You know, you got to think about the kind of personality that you're going to be bringing into the shop. You don't want to stress anyone out. You want to have something you know, almost reciprocal that you can trade with the person who would teach you how to tattoo. So as I kept pursuing, asking them to keep going back over the the four years that I was in college, by the, by the time I got to the very end and I was kind of able to talk with them more about oil painting and what I was doing in college, that's when he kind of took note and started kind of giving me the more or less the keys to get my foot in the door. So what kind of painting were you pursuing? What, what kind of stuff were you doing in college? Initially, I was doing, unfortunately, it was like abstract painting for the first couple of years. Then we got a, a, another professor in at the very end, and he was, he was like a Renaissance painter, um, layered oil figurative painting. And that's when I, I was like, okay, this is who I'd like to study with. So I got, I got together with him and his wife at the time. And I basically just kind of became their apprentice for oil painting. And what did that look like? What does an apprentice oil painter entail? One thing, I had a truck at the time. So he's like, okay, cool. We can haul supplies around. We can haul these paintings around by the wood that we need, by the canvas that we need. Um, so I was building and priming his canvases and using rabbit skin glue to treat the canvases. And turning it into like a lead white ground where I would then transfer his drawings onto the canvas. And I would use maybe, I would probably get it like five layers deep, just kind of like a, a push and a pull of, of lighter tones and darker tones. It was all transferred from using like an overhead projector. So I would be ch kind of just transferring his charcoal drawings from an overlay onto the canvas to kind of get him started. So, and then he would jump in and be like, okay, cool. It's primed. It's ready to roll. I know where to, I know where to take it from here. I've heard rabbit skin glue smells like shit. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. It, it's, it's really a disgusting smell. <laughs> I mean, you're just boiling powdered animal skin. So super vegan, you know? <laughs> yeah. Did that at like, dismantled pieces of your earth crisis pickled heart. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it, it, it counts as an edge break. I should have been shot. <laughs> oh shit. Yeah. Well, no, luckily no one will hear this. So nobody's listening. Perfect. It was for the art, man. It's for the art. That's right. That's right. So as you're pursuing that, I'm sure that the, this guy that you were priming canvases doing all this work for, he really expected you to 
blossom as an oil painter yourself? And then how long was it before you just ditched that whole life and decided you were going to be a tat master? He was watching me get a lot of tattoos at the time. There's kind of like starting to creep down my arm at this time, like later into college. And he's like, you know, have you ever considered pursuing integrating this into the oil paintings? And I was like, no, that just seems corny. I don't, I'm not really interested in that. Either I want to be a tattooer or I want to be an oil painter. And he's like, well, have you ever tried to tattoo? I was like, well, it's not, it's not that easy. You don't really get it. It's like selling your soul, giving everything up. I was like, I'm, I'm aware of this. I've been having these conversations. I've been trying to get in for a long time and it's not going to work. So, I mean, he just pretty much pursued it. You know, he even handed me down like his professorial jacket, like one of the, one of the professor jackets with the elbow pads. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, was, I was, you know, basically um, his and his first wife's a, apprentice, and I was just kind of thinking about how to pursue becoming a professor at a college for either teaching anatomy or figure structure or oil painting, you know, pretty much like him. And um, I had them filling out forms to go to grad school and that I sold an oil painting and I got enough money to, uh, I thought I had enough money that I could move to New York and kind of pursue grad school from there. And then um, instead, of, instead of using that smart, I went and got the rest of my arm tattooed. I just blew it all. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoops, I just ruined my life. Oh, well, I got, a, I got some tattoos on my forearm. Um, <laughs> Turned out to be the right choice. Uh, I think it was. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely think it was. Uh, you know, because maybe even at the time he was kind of thinking that I might be the assistant professor at the college or something like that. If I go to grad school, do this route, kind of do it the way that he said, come back and work with him. And then, you know, it's sort of like a, uh, I, I don't, I don't know the plan. I'm, I'm kind of speaking for him, but that's kind of seemed what it was like, you know, go to this grad school go get a little um, experience under your belt, come back and we'll figure it out. Because he had Italian people that were hiring him to do recreations of Dante's Inferno. And, and that's mainly what I was working on, just kind of doing uh, his drawings of Dante's Inferno for rich Italians. Yeah, I remember you telling me that, that he, that he had some crazy collectors that were commissioning stuff like that. Yeah, it was, it was this guy, um, Mark Musa. He was like a Dante scholar that hired him to just do all these crazy Dante paintings for him. Hmm. But yeah, I, I blew all that money instead of going to school with it, got tattooed. And the, the guy that gave me a tattoo was like, you know, why do you have money? <laughs> what are you doing with this? Are you like a rich kid? I was like, no, nah, no. Nah. I just, uh, I was going to go to grad school with this money and I just uh, pissed it on a tattoo. So he's like, you sold a painting? What? That's crazy. Let me check it out. And I had drawings and sketches and I, you know, I was trying to draw tattoos at the same time too. So I had a sketchbook in the car and it was, um, a lot of anatomy, figure structure, faces, skulls, intermixed with like really bad attempts at sort of new school skulls. And he's like, you know, have you ever considered an apprenticeship? And I was like, oh yeah, yeah. I've been trying to actively get one for five years. And he's like, well, let me talk to the owner. Let me see if I can work this out. He worked it out with her. They were like, if you move here, you know, that can be the apprenticeship. That's the first step. You got to move here. So I, I was actually living at that teacher's house at the time, uh, went and got all my stuff. And I, I moved to Augusta the next day, called the guy. He was in, he was actually in Italy. And I was like, Hey, I'm out of your house. I'm done. I, I got the tattoo apprenticeship. I thought he'd be stoked, but he's like, yeah, well, have fun ruining your fucking life. I was like, oh shit. Jeez. Okay, well, that didn't go over well. Damn. He was, yeah, he, he really took offense to it, so. Well, he saw the next year of his life having to do the rabbit skin glue himself, probably. Exactly. Till exactly, he found someone yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that it was just like part of painting to that level to have somebody do all of the shittiest parts of the process. Yeah, I didn't either. I, you know, at the time I was like, this seems weird. I feel like I'm, I'm involved, but you know, um, I had to, I had to read, uh, sections of, of sort of like Renaissance art about what the apprentices were expected to do. So there would just be like a whole school of apprentices working for one painter 
you know, taking it even many more steps further than I had to where they were basically just doing the paintings in the style for that person and then they would get the credit. Hmm. So, you know, like paintings from Caravaggio might not have even been painted by him. It might have been painted by two or three of his students working on the same canvas. Huh. And then Caravaggio is credited with the painting just because it came from his apprentices. That's interesting. People shit on tattoo apprenticeships, but at least you get credit for your terrible tattoos that you do at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Totally. Wow, that's kind of fucked, actually. Is that something that's discussed in the art world? I don't know a lot about real art, so I, maybe that's common knowledge and I'm just hearing it for the first time. I think, you know, he just tried to have the most traditional approach he could. I don't, I don't even think he did that. You know, he's just reading about Italian masters and it's like, yeah. okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it like they did. Right, because it makes him feel like more of a master if he has an apprentice the way that the masters did. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely think that's kind of what he was going for, too. Hmm. You showed him. Did I tell you the last part of that story? I don't remember. Let's go. Take me there. Oh, yeah. He's been fired from his position as a tenured professor for assault, Ooh. you know, three or four times over. Sick. I think it was last time that you and I were talking about that story is when I was like, what's this guy up to now? He basically told me to go fuck myself. <laughs> Let's see how he's doing. And it, it had basically just happened. I pulled it up. So the headlines were from maybe a year ago or, you know, the last time that you were here on the guest spot. And it was um, two, two girls. I mean, you know, you can, you can find it online if you look it up. USC painting professor. <laughs> he basically took two girls to Italy and uh, it went real bad. Oh, God. As you can guess. Jeez. And his wife had um, restraining orders against him. So, yeah. Damn. Yeah. I definitely think he, he liked the master idea for sure. Well, I was going to say probably a lot like the, the great masters. <laughs> That's another quality that maybe shouldn't uh, <laughs> continue on. A hundred percent. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. The, the abuse was ripe in the Renaissance era. Fuck. Well, I'm glad you made it out to tell the tale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never took the Italy trip, thankfully. You know, it's funny because, uh, you know, I'm, I was co coating these canvases with lead white paint. And I was like, hey, does this have lead in it? He's like, yeah, it's called lead white. I was like, so I'm like just using lead paint. Do I need to wear gloves? He's like, no, what are you fucking talking about? <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, I, I coat this thing with four coats of lead white with a palette knife and then I sand it down. Should I be inhaling this dust? He's like, yeah, you sissy, who gives a shit? <laughs> so, I mean, maybe it was the lead white. I don't know. And it drove him mad. Yeah, it might have. And, you know, it's just weird because I would have never thought that the things I read about this guy would have been connected with who I knew. Well, see, that's interesting because yeah, I would think yeah. that you would, you can, a lot of people can look back on these situations and see common threads in their personalities and stuff. So that's kind of shocking actually that he held that under wraps a little bit. No, tighter. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he couldn't have been more um, complimentary about his wife's paintings and, you know, the girls in the class. And he had a daughter that he just thought was the sweetest. And I could barely put those two stories together, hmm. which you know, it kind of scares, scares you about everyone you could ever meet, you know? Right. Well, he just must have forgotten about all those things. Yeah. Lead white. It'll do it to you. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> so I was, uh, lately I've been pulling some old books out, some old tattoo books, stuff that I would read religiously when I was first tattooing. And I feel like I haven't pulled some of them out in a while. And it's really funny to see how cyclical stuff in tattooing is. Oh yeah, Absolutely. I love to read old stuff um, from decades or, or more ago and, and read people's accounts of how tattooing is over because something new just happened that ruined the whole thing and we're all doomed. Right. And, yeah. that, and now it's like six, you know, 60 years later. <laughs> and, but it's like still the same yeah. problems. I guess maybe that's just how the, the world is or, or just in general. But I pulled out the old um, tattoo times and uh, I like to read the, the intro 
I guess it's like a little essay that Ed Hardy would write at the beginning of, of each one. And there was one from 1983. Oh, it's, it's the greatest. This episode is sponsored by Black Dagger Books. Last week, I told you all about how a subscription to Black Dagger Books will get you a new book every month featuring some of the hardest working tattooers in the game. These books are showcasing the paintings from these tattooers, which I personally love to see. Black Dagger Books is also always cooking up some special releases in addition to their monthly books. Last year, they made a book called Jesus, featuring over 60 tattoo artists and their wide-ranging interpretations of the iconic figure of Christ, all in a gorgeous limited edition hardbound release. And now, I'd like to announce that their next limited edition release, Memento Mori, 90 artists and their depictions of the contemplation of death. You'll even find a painting by me in this one. Head over to blackdaggerbooks.com today to check out the pre-order that just went live for their new book, Memento Mori, and to sign up for your own monthly subscription. This episode is sponsored by DOS M, who are innovators, not imitators, when it comes to marketing. For the last decade, DOS M have tested methods over countless markets to ensure they're always the best at what they do and up to date with the ever-evolving landscape. There are many people who know marketing, but DOS M is one of the only agencies that specializes in the tattoo industry. Whether you're trying to build more clientele or you're booked until the year 3000, but you're looking to find other revenue streams, this message is for you. Head over to digitaltattooers.com today to set up your free consultation, which is normally $500. And because you're a Loyal Books Close listener, mention this episode and you'll also get 50% off all DOSM services with a $1,000 credit right off the bat. All you have to do is reach out before the end of 2023. This is an amazing value to help you start doing more for your business and it all comes with guaranteed results or your money back. Don't waste your time trying to learn the internet yourself because you should really be working on your tattoos. Like seriously working on your tattoos. It's all going down at digitaltattooers.com and thank you to Doss M for sponsoring this episode and being a great supporter of Books Closed. Yeah. He, uh, he mentions the rise in tattooing's popularity and he attributes it to present day conditions of international cross-cultural contact negative pressure generated in a high-tech society and dissatisfaction with traditional religion. Oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> I just think it's funny to think about 1983 to feel like a high-tech society, but of course, at any given point, we're going to feel like we're as advanced as it's ever going to be. But like, what was the tech? And yeah, That's like the dawn of cable, Yeah, basically. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe that's just like some, some movie or some movie or some TV show showed like a tattoo or two. And maybe that's like the high tech society that he's referring to. Right, but it's just right. so funny to think about that compared to now, like 40 years later. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, even, even in 83, you've got tattoo running side by side with pop culture, like, you know, Stray Cats, Billy Idol, Motley Crue, they were all flashing tattoos on MTV all day long. I mean, that's definitely the thing that put the seed in my head for sure. Yeah, and, and maybe that could be a time that could really be pinpointed as when, when pop culture really was featuring tattooing in a way that hadn't been before. Because I'm sure there are always tattooed people, but I feel like before that, I don't, I don't know. I'm sure there's some historian people who can point out some instances of it. But I would think that that's like in the 80s would be the time for those exact reasons and those exact people kind of putting it in front of your face. Yeah, because I mean, if you had, you know, three or four channels before that, and then you get MTV and HBO, and you're starting to see, you know, the uh, subversives on there wearing tattoos, that's gonna feel like it's everywhere all at once if everyone's experiencing that same sort of like pop culture timeline at the exact same time. You turn on MTV and everyone gets the same video at the same time, you're gonna all experience that tattoo for the first time, for the second time, for the third time, and they're all just showing their dissatisfaction with traditional religion all at once. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of the greatest things I think Ed Hardy wrote in that too was when he was trying to pinpoint, in, in the same tattoo times that you're referencing, he's trying to pinpoint why it showed up in every culture since the dawn of time, and he called it psychological armor. I was like, that's the smartest thing anyone's ever written about tattooing. Yeah, because you got to think there's a common thread that like there's something about it that draws anyone to it, regardless of the context or or whatever their even their intention is. But 
yeah, I mean, I think that sums it sums it up pretty well. We're just these, you know, fleshy, fragile carcasses, and if we decorate them with dragons or anything that feels like armor, it makes you feel like you've got a little bit of protection against the world, I guess. Yeah, I've I have some clients sometimes who talk about how they don't want to get their backs tattooed because they're not going to see it. They don't like even people who are like pretty right. pretty heavily tattooed otherwise, but they're not to that point yet. Um, but I always just tell them mm-hmm. that you, even if you don't see it, you can feel it. When you have your whole back tattooed, you can just feel it. That's right. That's right. You know it's there. Yeah. I think an interesting thing about those tattoo times, going back through and reading, the intent of the whole thing really seemed to be trying to validate tattooing as a legitimate art form and, and something worth being studied and archived in a way that it hadn't up until that point. And I think it's easy to take it for granted now because it's just such a part of everybody's life and it's accepted and people do appreciate it as true art. And there are so many people who are fantastic artists who have found their way into tattooing. But it's comparing it to the way that there are, is like magazine or internet coverage of tattooing now, it is completely something so different. And it makes me wonder, is it, is, is it so, is everything just so shallow? Is it all very surface level now? Or do you think that there's still that depth to it and maybe we just don't talk about it in the same way? It's different for sure. I mean, the tattoo times, that was really the first time that you had like a fine artist, like Ed Hardy coming from a fine art background, thinking about um, sociology and psychology and really taking a minute to appreciate all forms of tattooing as academic because he had he had just a wide appreciation of all forms of tattooing in those tattoo times so to me i i think that's the bible right there it's like tattooing got amazing from that without the tattoo times it's it's a it looks like a completely different landscape now because i mean he's covering tribal tattoos and talking about the history of that and how it can how it's evolved over the years. Um, he's talking about uh, you know the, the origins of flash from sailors to now. Um, it's just such an academic approach. I just I don't think there's ever been anything smarter about tattooing written before. I wonder what the reception of those publications were at the time. I wonder if the if he was met with um, pushback from tattooers at that point. I'm sure, I'm sure approaching, approaching any bit of tattooing like a, a higher art, you're going you're gonna to get pushback for sure. Ultimately, by the time I experienced the tattoo times, just from looking at them in tattoo shops in the mid to late 90s, those were the ones that tattooers were like, hey, you can look at any of these books, but don't fuck these up. You know, this is, this is, this is real tattooing right here. So, I mean, they would have only been like 10 years old at that time. So my experience of it from older tattooers at that point, they, they really appreciated it. But I'm sure at the moment, you know, anything that's new is going gonna, is gonna to get equal pushback for sure as acceptance. Yeah. So I'm sure there were tattooers that were like, you shouldn't be writing about tattooing like this. You're, you're bringing it into the mainstream pop culture in a way that we don't think is acceptable. You're going to introduce people that shouldn't be into tattooing to try to get their foot in the door. I guess it's always that scarcity mentality, but I, I guess it would just always be short-sighted because it's going to bring way more customers into the mix than tattooers always. So it, that can only be a good thing as far as being able to do more interesting work and having better educated everybody. Yeah. I mean, from my understanding was that you could get those in, in sort of like uh left of the dial bookshops at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like a, you could go into a, a, a punk clothing store and you could pick up a few copies of that. I mean, you weren't going to find it at, you know, at a, at a mega bookstore at the time. I mean, being in South Carolina, I couldn't find any tattoo magazines when I was there, when I was growing up, we were just sort of looking at like the back of the easy rider motorcycle magazines or whatever for you know what what our take on tattoo culture was at that time. This episode is sponsored by Tattoo Dream. Have you ever wished you could bring all of your reference and sketchbooks with you wherever you went? The tools from Tattoo Dream allow you to do just that with their Procreate stamp brushes, digital flash, and downloadable books. Don't worry if your walls are already full or if your bag's a little too heavy. 
Let your iPad do the heavy lifting and load it up with all the reference a tattooer could ever need. You will have access to unlimited design elements whether you're at the shop, at home, or on the road. Everything on TattooDream.com is designed by a collective of the world's leading tattooers, including Paul Dobelman, Danny Derrick, Valerie Vargas, Austin Maples, Tony Nelson, and many, many more. Tattoo Dream also has streamable seminars. They cover the topics of drawing, painting, and photography, so you can continue to expand your knowledge base. Once you've enrolled in a course, you can take your time at your own pace on your own schedule. Head over to TattooDream.com today to see for yourself. And I'm having some tattoo dreams of my own right now. This episode is sponsored by Equal Vision Records. Any regular listener of this show knows that my ultimate dream guest is Fred Durst. He used to tattoo, did you know that? I may have mentioned that before. Anyway, although he's the best musician as far as I'm concerned, I guess I should still mention the next best thing in music, Equal Vision Records. I grew up listening to tons of Equal Vision bands and if you've spent time in tattoo shops, you surely have heard some too. We're talking bands like Hot Water Music, Yellow Card, Saves the Day, Anne Berlin, Hail the Sun, Polyphia, and the list goes on and on, and it's far too long to share anymore right now, but I think you're picking up what I'm putting down. Head over to equalvision.shop today and get 20% off your order with discount code BOOKSCLOSE. That's all one word. This excludes pre-order items, but everything else is ready to get packed up and delivered to your doorstep. You won't find any Limp Bizkit albums there, but you can't hold it against them. That's discount code books closed at equalvision.shop for 20% off your order. What is it that you think uh, draws you to Japanese style tattooing? I think a lot of it was just sort of, you know, right place, right time. I, uh, one of the first tattoos I ever tried to draw for a friend was a dragon. That was when I was 17 or 18. And I think it was, um, I'm pretty sure the only reference I had was a, a tattoo magazine from 1996. And I want to say it was a Paul Jeffries dragon that I was looking at for reference. She asked me to draw a dragon for her so she could take it into a tattoo shop and get it tattooed. So um, I spent some time drawing for her, trying to decipher what was happening with a dragon. I was like, okay, yeah, I see it. And then I you know, started trying to draw it. And I didn't know which way the legs went. I didn't know which way the scales went. I didn't know which way the barbels were. I couldn't, I just couldn't make sense of it. It was so like esoteric to me. Um, and I didn't, I didn't realize it until I sat down with it and tried to figure out the anatomy and the composition for it. I was just completely lost. And then I got, I finally got it, uh, you know, good enough to where I was like, all right, here's your drawing. And she took it to a tattoo shop in Charlotte and, uh, and the guy was like, I can't put this on you. This thing's fucking terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Once I uh, sort of did my first real Japanese attempt at a half sleeve, it was just, it was rough. It was really, really, really rough. Um, and I think I've just been trying to dig myself out of the hole since then. I'm still trying to do a good one uh, to redeem myself from that first one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have a theory about you. Let me, me. Sh- let me share it with you. Okay. And I guess it's a theory that I've felt about other people too who um, find, or people that do a lot of Japanese tattooing. I feel like it's a particular type of person that really gets deep into it. And the fact that you have like a proper art school background, you're, you're like studious and structured and, and like classically trained. And I feel like Japanese tattooing almost requires a similar approach. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd back that up for sure. Um, if, if I've got a, any project to do, I, I kind of beat myself up with the homework and almost even make it unenjoyable drawing it. I don't really have fun drawing. I just, uh, kind of, over-reference it, try to spend too much time on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely like a little bit of hate yourself, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I'm not the only one that feels that way as I'm drawing my my stuff. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, it, it, it's studious, it's, it's referenced, it's researched, and I think you want to never 
think that you got it just because you've done something 50 times uh, or 100 times or 1,000 times. I think that's when it should start to get even harder in a weird way. Yeah. You know, you're like, okay, well, am I just writing the formula or am I just trying to push it as far as I can possibly take it? Yeah, because to me it seems like you can. there's so much depth to it that you can focus on the imagery and the visual aspect of it and do great tattoos. And then if you want, you can get into the literature, all the stuff that the stories that kind of create a lot of the imagery and you could spend, I don't know, 10 lifetimes really developing your sensibilities with this kind of stuff. And I've always been drawn to it, but I feel like it's, it's intimidating almost because I feel like it's such a, a overwhelming thing to undertake that it's kind of like, slowed me down from really probably pursuing the style as much as I feel like I would like to. Yeah, for sure. The thing that sort of made me feel a little bit better about approaching it was that even Horiyoshi the third said that it's going to take two lifetimes to figure out Japanese tattooing. And that's coming from a guy who was born into the culture. You know, those stories are part of his psyche. He was apprenticed by someone who spent 40 years tattooing in that style. Um, so I don't know. It was like, I, that kind of made me okay with it. I'm like, I'm, I might only ever get to the point where I'm 3% well-versed in, in Japanese tattooing by the end of my career. And you know, if it, if that's all it is, that's fine with me. It's just kind of about the pursuit of it. Okay. I'll start doing body suits tomorrow then. I feel better. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite tattoo image? I would say probably the dragon, you know? It's like that was my first catastrophic failure for uh, <laughs> pursuing Japanese tattooing. So it's the one that I'd be happy tattooing daily. There's so many, so many variations, uh, so many elements, so many colors, so many different stories. Um, I think it's just kind of endless if I was just sort of stuck in, in that, like, okay, you're going to do a dragon sleeve every single day for the rest of your life. That'd be fine with me. You know, just keep working it out and see where it goes. Yeah. How about you? Um, I was thinking about that cause I knew you were going to ask me. Oh, okay. I feel like I just like a, I like a skull. Oh yeah. 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 Primo. It's, cl it's cliche, but there's just something about a skull. It, it means a lot to me as far as like how you can use it in designs, I guess. I don't know. No, I, it's, it's, the, it's the one unifying image right there. Everyone's got one and we're all going to turn into one. So it's fine. But we all want to act like we don't want to see it because it's like gross. We pretend that we're not all just skulls with some meat on top. How many do you have tattooed on you? Oh, I don't know. I don't have any. You have no skulls? No, I'm kidding. I probably have, uh, I got at least a few. Some of them are wearing hoodies. Some of them are not. Was that the first tattoo you did on yourself? Actually, yeah. Actually, yeah. I've only ever did one little tattoo on myself, and it was a skull, and it is on one of my thighs. Nice. And I thought that I had drawn, like, the coolest little skull that was different, and it was fresh and new, and it was just the dumbest fucking thing ever. <laughs> it, re it resembled a skull in that it had, like, the important characteristics that a skull has, but everything else about it was just peculiar and not in a, a in a cool or yeah. <laughs> interesting way. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did you, did you totally. tattoo yourself? Yeah. Skull, skull on the ankle. Well, I guess that's a, a good way to, um, segue into talking about individuality as a tattooer, because I thought I had it figured out before I even tattooed a real person, but I quickly realized that for me, that's probably a, uh, two lifetime pursuit. But how important do you think individuality yeah, or individuality is as a tattooer? It's kind of paramount. That should be what you're pursuing is, you know, you, you should strive to have a voice. We get a, a cluster of vocabulary words, which is basically like all the tattoo images in the world. And then you can put them together and make a, a song that's your own or a poem that's your own. It should, you should strive for the voice. Because, I mean, the tattoos where, I just don't know how many tattooers we need where it's just, you know, another person tracing a Greek or Roman statue and applying it verbatim. Like, that's, that's pretty boring to me. I think, 
you know, you could take that story and those myths and those gods and do your own version of it and come up with something that has a voice and a style to it. Because it's not bad to have uh, influence. If you can see the influence from somebody, that's totally cool. It's it, it, it's kind of joining the line and not thinking that you've recreated anything. You just sort of pick up the lineage and, and just add two cents to it. Can we blame the general tattoo clientele for that lack of uh, like lack of request or lack of uh, allowing to get something that's different? Because I, th- I know I, a lot of people talk about how they feel that their their clients are maybe limiting their ability to do something that's different. No, because I think I think people I think tattooers love people telling people how it is and how it should be in certain situations, like this is upside down, you can't do it this way. I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna mix this flower with this pattern. So I think blaming the clientele and just saying, "Eh, whatever, they just want this dumb shit. You know, I, I think that could possibly be the tattooer's fault. If you're willing to have a conversation and say like, I like this theme, I like this approach, uh, just, you know, just taking some time to let them know what you can do and help them make a better decision and say like, okay, well, you know, if you search, if you Google search tattoo right now, you're going to look like the first eight pages of tattoo. If I do it this way and I do it this way and I do it this way, we can still sort of meet what you're expecting and add a little bit to it. And, you know, I, I think, I think you can, I think you can mold clients for sure. You know, I mean, that's, what's going to happen with, you know, an architect or a designer, you know, you can't just do whatever people ask for if it's not going to hold up well over time. And if aesthetically it's not going to work, I think, I think it's up to the tattooer to help clients make good decisions. I guess one of the hurdles is that it's, it takes more work on our end as tattooers because you're going to have to do some extra drawing and sometimes you might strike out, but it's part of, of trying to mold what people expect. And I feel like that could be holding some people back from not just grabbing the statue reference and then doing the statue again. Cause that's easy. Oh yeah. 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 There's, I mean, there's virtually no homework with that. So, I mean, if people want to complain about it, that's, that's on them. It's, it's so easy to trace a statue because someone already perfected the art of that. And then they're just plagiarizing it. I mean, there's there's good versions of it. I've seen it. I'm just kind of blown away that that's um, that we need that many Roman statue plagiarists in tattooing. <laughs> well, now we know it was probably the the apprentices of the people making the statues, and they they didn't probably even make it themselves. So maybe it's a taste <laughs> of their own medicine that they're getting plagiarized a little bit, and they can't do shit about it. Cycle of life, that's how it is, yeah. <laughs> Survival of the fittest, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm always torn because it's, I, I don't know what to think. I don't know who to blame. I don't know what it is. Sometimes I feel like I get beaten down by by requests that I get. And then I definitely, I have found myself just doing the thing that is easier because it's like giving in to what people want. For example, like what? What do you mean? Well, I mean, like the statue is a is a good example because that is a, a reference or a request that I've gotten from people. And there's been times where I've drawn, you know, a more uh, unique to them version or a different take on the idea. And sometimes I've done just the photo of the statue from the internet. Right, yeah. And um, I feel like I, I end up, by the end of it, feeling like I wish I had done more at the beginning. Right. Because even if you technically apply it in a way and, and even if I feel that I've like progressed on technique in that style through that tattoo, I wish that I had done that in addition to also having a, like, a, a, like the original concept that I'm more proud of. Yeah. I mean, I, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's terrible to do it as a technical experience, but to build an entire career off that, like some people, and you definitely haven't. I mean, you've worked you've worked hard to come up with something that's instantly recognizable as yours. And, and I see it like right away without even seeing the, the name roll up on Instagram. I'm like, Oh, there's Andrews, there's Andrews. 
I see it right away. Fuck It's got yeah. a voice. It's got a style. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely, dude. It's almost like um, I started thinking about this recently where I was like, all right, what, what tattooer represents what band or genre of music? It's oh. kind of like a fun experiment to think about like the the parallels between music, genre, band. I mean, you know, because it, it started, I was like, all right, what is what is Ed Hardy? What what band, what genre? Mm-hmm. And uh, to me, I think it's Black Sabbath. Yeah. Like, that's, that's where everything good came from. He started it. He started, he started heavy metal for the most part. And then, you know, something like your approach, what you're doing right now with intermixing traditional designs that are melting and uh, almost going like a weird like push and pull, like how Francis Bacon would. Do you know who I'm talking about? The painter Francis Bacon? No. I think you'd recognize it if you saw it. It's, you know, it would be like these aggressive things that are kind of uh, look like uh even though it's a flat painting, it, it looks like it's in motion, and that's that's kind of what you're doing with some of the melting oh, faces. Oh, yeah. I'm just looking it up here now. Yeah, and that's you're, awesome. And you're mixing tribal with it. You know, it's it's almost like that could be a version of math core. Oh. You've got these weird punctuations, like these stop moments in the tribal, and then it picks back up, and then the tribal weaves into the face that's melting and turning into something else. It's like you wouldn't expect, uh, you know, a sort of thick line traditional uh, girl head to be interspliced with tribal. Um, and, you know, I mean, that's kind of like what's happening in, in moments of like math core where the music is like, what is, is this jazz? Is this metal? Is this hardcore? Is this a breakdown? <laughs> right. It just stopped and then yeah. it just frantically picks back up. Yeah, I just can't decide what I actually like. So I just do it all. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's a re- it's a really good take on it. It's it's instantly recognizable as yours for sure. So, well, thank you very much. That means a lot to me to hear that from you. But if you if you're striving for your tattoos to be a band or a style of music, what would it be? And whether you think you've achieved it or not is one thing. But what, like in your head, what song plays when you finish a back piece and you roll back and your your victory music comes on? What what would that be? Um nothing for sure. I can't, I can't even think of it, but I mean, there are times where I'm like, okay, I'm going to use this, this band in my headphones while I'm drawing this tattoo. That's normally not uh, what my hand wants to do for drawing. Like if I'm, if I'm drawing like a, I don't know, like a Japanese angel or something, I want to hear something a little more like ethereal and soft. So I'll use a soundtrack to kind of help me get there. Mm. Um, you know, if it's if it's a samurai, maybe maybe I'm listening to like battle metal. But as far as like saying uh, picking out a genre or a band for myself, I think that's impossible. I don't know. I could do it for almost anyone else, but except for myself. <laughs> You're too close to it. I'm trying to think what I would assign. I feel like the thing that stands out about your work to me all the time is your backgrounds are like very unique. And similarly, when I see your stuff come across my feed, I always know it's you. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Um, and there's just something about it. And it's it's not that it's just one certain uh, like subject matter. It, it crosses all of it, whether it's water or wind or rocks or whatever it might be. There's there's something about it that's just like decidedly different. Um, do you feel like you really strive to push yourself to keep that stuff interesting? Because it's such a huge part of tattooing large-scale work like that, that there's inevitably always going to be those unifying background elements. I I don't know. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to say successful or not, but I think yesterday was better than the day before. And I hope tomorrow is better than today. So, (laughs) I, I mean, there, there are things where, you know, when I first started trying to draw Japanese backgrounds, I, I was bombing it because I was like, well, it's just a pattern. It's just a pattern. It's just shapes. It's just circles. It's just swirls. And I think if you kind of pay attention to the environment and the atmosphere, um, I mean, that's one of the things I like about going to the Northeast so much is the landscape. I like spending as much time outside as possible. 
because it's such a different landscape than this. It's, it's mega rock cliffs and just gigantic waves just crashing. So I'll stand there and just watch, uh, this sounds so stupid as I'm saying it out loud, but, um, <laughs> I just watch, <laughs> I'm just watching the waves crash and I'm like, all right, how would I draw that? And you know, each, each crash of each new wave is a different way that you could approach it. I think tattooing taught me to look at the environment and outside in nature as something unique and beautiful where I never thought about it before I started tattooing. It was all just background. I kind of like really didn't even care to be outside that much. I just kind of thought about the world as like places to skateboard. That was, that was like my entire aesthetic growing up. I was like, oh, there's some cool stairs. That's a cool handrail. Uh, that's a cool little set right there. That's a cool curb. And then I started tattooing and then that kind of rerouted the way that I think about everything. I was like, it's cool to be in nature. That's a cool leaf. Uh, look at the way that twig moves. Um, look at the snake in the, in this, in the grass here. Look at the way these waves are crashing. So I think, um, yeah, just paying attention to what's real in front of you is a good way to think about how to progress in the drawing itself. It's the lead paint effect on your brain. You're just, it's finally catching up with you. So you're able to appreciate the finer things in life. That's right. It's, it's melting my cerebral cortex and it's all starting to look like, uh, um, I'm high on drugs watching the moss blow. <laughs> no, that's one of the things that I love being in, in the shop. Like I'm, I'm up off of the street, but there's trees and there's leaves. There's magnolias blooming. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's pretty beautiful just to look out the window and just have something that's just not desolate city or a strip mall plaza. Yeah. I love this shop. you you have a great space. Um, uh, the setting is awesome. It's in a cool neighborhood. It, it's like a little bit of a, a hidden gem, of course, but I'm sure that's by design. Do you feel like you've noticed a lot of changes in in how you work or anything about just working in a space more like that versus being in a more uh, like a high energy studio with a bunch of people tattooing all the time? Yeah, it's completely different. Um, I mean, I, I loved my experience at Anonymous and everybody that I worked with. And then this just kind of fell in my lap. This was my wife's fabric store. Uh, and then she had to close it down for COVID and asked if I wanted to pick up on the lease. And I didn't think that it would even remotely be zoned for tattooing. When I first got in here, I was literally tattooing out of the corner of a fabric store. We just pushed <laughs> all the fabric to the front of the shop and I just kind of renovated this corner. And I just started kind of apologizing to my clients when they would walk in. I was like, hey, I'm sorry. I'm in a fabric store. There's no sign. Uh, just meet me. I'll meet you outside. I'll show you where it is. It's upstairs and we'll just be in the corner of this fabric st store. <laughs> and no one cared at all. It was kind of, it was kind of nice. It's like my clients weren't concerned about anyone listening to what they were saying. It's kind of a, kind of a weird thing to, to walk into a spot and have someone's ear for seven, eight hours that's not looking at their phone or you're watching a movie with. No one's listening. There's not a shop person. There's not, there's, there's no distractions. So yeah, it completely changed everything. It was just hyper personal, you know, it was, it was pretty great. It was a great change. Do you think that as there are more like small studios that people are working out of, um, for example, if a new younger tattooer is just starting out now and they only ever work in that situation, do you think that they are missing out on, on an experience by being in a street shop? Yeah, for sure. But I mean, I don't even know how someone could pull it off. Like who's, who's going to come to your private studio and get tattooed from somebody that has three tattoos to back it up? Because they have 300,000 followers. I mean, you know it's possible. You know the kind of people yeah. I'm talking about because maybe they were yeah. an artist first and they have a huge following for their art already or they did something else that was super public right. and that, you know, if they were a famous musician or, or something and then they're like, all right, I'm going to do tattoos now, then, you know, their audience will definitely come out even if it's in a fabric store. They don't give a fuck. Yeah, you're totally right. You're totally right. I forgot about that avenue. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess those people would be outliers though, but as 
I guess that's a good point. It could be hard to build a clientele, but let's say it's like in a small town, it's somebody who's just like knows people, somebody who's a, a person around town that's likable and, and nice and maybe was a bartender forever. Or maybe they, you know, they did something where they know yeah. people. Maybe yeah, they're, yeah. they're not like world famous necessarily, but right. I, I just think about how much you can learn from working in a street shop setting, whether it's something you want to do long term or not. Um, and I, I just wonder what that's going to look yeah. like for people who never have that. Are they going to be so unequipped to deal with like the occasional shithead that comes through? Because I feel like that's one of the things that you learn about, you know, from being in a street shop is you get all these experiences with so many different people and it's all oh, like yeah. compressed into a yeah. small amount of time. It's good approaches either way. If someone can pull it off that they don't need to work in a flash shop, that's fine. I don't, I don't think everybody needs my exact experience or anyone else's experience to appreciate tattooing. But yeah, I mean, tattooing in a, in like a street shop that will teach you what the world really looks like. It's almost like walking into Walmart, you know? Like you forget that that's pretty much what the world looks like. You're like, oh yeah, this guy, this guy, this guy. Right, right, right. How do I talk to this person for four hours? So, I mean, when I started tattooing, and I started tattooing kinds of people that I would have never hung out with and appreciating their experience. It, it taught me to appreciate the world in a different way. I mean, I, w I can't say I ever hung out with anyone other than my grandparents who had been in the military. And then I started tattooing and then the military was paying my rent. I was like, okay, well, this is definitely making me think about the military a little bit differently now. So uh, I would have thought all of the military was the exact same person before I started hearing about how people wound up in there. Some people wound up getting arrested and that was their way to not go to jail, was to join the military. And I never once considered that that was an option for why somebody would join the military. I don't know, it's just, it, it really is a, a, a wide swath of the world working on a street shop. It's not, it's not paramount, but um, it could be a really good way to appreciate different cultures and different friend groups and different perspectives than you would normally have from just tattooing the people that you met at your bar. I look back and I'm glad that I had the experience because it makes me appreciate how nice it is now to be a little bit of a slower pace, more in control, um, and feel like just giving an overall better experience to every person that I come into contact with through tattooing them. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I definitely agree. Cause if you're only tattooing your friends, you're never going to have to think how to curb your language to sort of <laughs> right. interact with, with the rest of the world. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm glad it worked out that way for me, uh, that I was able to have a little bit of both of it. I'm, I'm sure it was the same for you too. You know, you're just kind of start out tattooing your friends from bands and like the hardcore scene or whatever. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the rest of it, the stuff that actually pays is, is people that are getting paid on the first and the 15th, you know, like military or government workers or whatever. It's just such a different world than what we're used to hearing about. It's interesting to think about how, you know, what things look like going forward, because I, I guess I agree that you don't need that experience because if somebody starts off in a more, uh, you know, a more a quieter, smaller studio setting, and that's how they just work for their entire career, then it, why does it matter? They don't really need to see anything else. Right. And most people aren't going to go right. backward, you know, what I would consider backwards, unless they really want to just work in that style or in that way that's faster paced. Yeah, I, I caught the lot, the last podcast you did where you mentioned your apprentice, like what's her situation like? Is she tattooing her friends? Is she tattooing walk-ins? Like how do you, how are you approaching it? Oh, she quit. <laughs> did she? No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> she has not tattooed oh a, a person yet, but it is scheduled for okay. a couple weeks from now and it's a friend of hers. Um, and so she's been doing practice skins like a fiend and she's going to be kick ass. Uh huh. But don't tell her that because I don't want her to get a big head, but she's going to be kick ass. I, I won't tell her. I won't tell her. <laughs> I'm trying to ride the line of being supportive, but not over complimentary. Although in my head, I feel like it'd be easy to be very complimentary because I keep, as I'm explaining things to her, 
and and uh, Bill that I own the shop with, he's uh, he's also doing a lot to help her out. Everyone at the shop is is pitching in and, and giving her a lot of great advice, and she's really good at asking questions. Mm-hmm. But I feel like as things come up and as she's starting to, like the first couple of times she's doing outlines on a practice skin, first time working with machines ever. And um, I'm like explaining things and preparing her to hit all the pitfalls that I remember that I had hit and all the things that like plagued me and that I thought were so difficult. And she fucking breezes right through all of it. None of it is an issue. None of it is like, life ruining like it felt for me and um i don't know it's it's filling me with a lot of optimism for uh, her ability to make this thing happen so it's pretty exciting she seemed really sweet just hearing her in the background she's yeah she's great and she's also like a real adult who's lived a real life and has worked very hard and at many different things so she she deserves to to have this tat life i believe now when you're doing in a an apprenticeship for somebody in 2023 Mm -hmm. and the world is completely different than how it looks when you or I started tattooing. Mm -hmm. Is it mandatory to use coil machines? Is it mandatory to build your own needles, learn how to mix ink or is that just null and void at this point and you just sort of teach someone with a, with a magic wand or. See, that's a great question because I hadn't really thought about that at first. And then when it came time for her to start working with machines, I thought, well, shit, what is the right answer to that? What do you think is the right answer to that? Um, I I don't know. And I guess that's why I don't have an apprentice because I don't, I don't, I don't know (laughs) the answers. I mean, we had decided to start her on coil machines and uh the reason being, I feel that you get a lot more information back from a coil machine as you're working than you do from a rotary or a pen machine, whether it's what you hear, what you feel. Um, A lot of that, you don't get that feedback with a pen machine and you could just maybe never figure out why something isn't going your way. But with a coil machine, I I feel like it's better for learning on whether that's something she sticks with or not. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense for sure. Yeah. Um, It's a completely different experience. You're going to know if you're digging too much, if you're not sinking the needle in right. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, are you guys like starting from the ground up? Is it like put your own machine together, cut your own springs or? Nope. Is it just machines that already work? Yeah, just machines that already work. I, even when I learned initially, um, I learned how to make needles, but I never actually did it. Like I didn't put it into practice. I didn't work. I didn't work with needles I had made. Maybe one time I made a needle and actually used it. So I kind of, even when, when I learned it, it was kind of just for show and I'm glad I knew it, but I would have to kind of like jog my memory to do it today. So that was never a reality for me. Right. I had learned, I had learned how to mix, uh, to mix pigments, uh, which I really like knowing how to do, but I haven't done that in so long. I don't, I don't know if it's necessary. Yeah, I, I, I'm, ve- I'm very curious as far as like how that's going to work for people that decide to take on apprentices at three years. Like you, you have the experience that you did it, you know, you know what making a needle looks like, you know what cutting springs looks like, uh, you know what an autoclave looks like. But for someone that has never experienced that world and they've only entered into tattooing post Instagram uh, post pin machine, like that's going to look like the most traditional thing at some point, you know, mm-hmm. you give it 20 years and you'll be like, yeah, it was so different. When I started, like we had Instagram, we had pin machines, we were doing it the right way. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. G- give something 20 years and everything's going to be traditional. Right. Right. And, and there'll be probably not a podcast, but whatever the newest version of media is. And they'll be read, they'll be referencing this the way I read a 40 year old tattoo time introduction from Ed. Oh my God. And they'll make fun of us for being old fucks. Oh my God. Yeah. Listen to these stupid idiots (laughs) blabber on. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess the discussion about just equipment and, and learning about or like how much you learn about your equipment as a tattooer for an apprentice today might be, be an even better way to ask, which the question that I was kind of asking about, like working in a private studio your whole career versus the street shop, because the equipment is is something that everybody experiences, is using machines and knowing more or less about it. But I, I just, I think it's, there are things that are good to know, whether you use them or not. 
Um, you, you know, when you're teaching someone, you can decide how much emphasis you want to put on it and how much time you expect them to devote to learning these various things. But the reality is I don't think anyone needs to learn any of it because all this equipment no, will always be available. I Cause when I was, when I was taught that stuff at first, there were people, um, that I worked with people that I was, um, working amongst at that time who were all the people who were teaching me this stuff and the attitude was kind of like, well, if if one day you can't, you just can't buy this stuff, then you need to know how to make all your own shit, and that made sense to me. And so for that, I'm glad that if the world ends, right. I can still do a stupid right. ass tattoo right. on somebody who doesn't exist because the world's ended. <laughs> so that that information really served me well. But yeah, but I don't think there will ever be a time that you you can't get this stuff. There just won't be. No, I think I think that um, that idea and that mentality is good. You know, especially at the time when there were like two tattoo companies. What was there? Like Papillon and National? Yeah. You're know, like, yeah, you need you need to know how to do this shit because, you know, these two companies might not last. So you need to know how to mix your own ink and make your own needles. But even still, like where would you buy the, the single needles from, you know? Right. Well, everyone was right because the companies didn't last. But that's only because there were like 100 that's bigger true. ones in their place. <laughs> Right. Yeah. A hundred bigger, better ones. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) A tattooer starts today, doesn't learn even an ounce of any of that stuff. I don't think it makes them any less of a tattooer than anyone else. That's just a part of it that doesn't apply. I'm sure we can think of examples of things that people did 50 years ago that we would never do now. And we're not less of tattooers because we don't, you know, change our fucking dirty bucket water six times you know, every six days or whatever. I was also reading in tattoo time. <laughs> yeah, that shit's horrifying, dude. Yeah. No, I mean, because you're totally right. I mean, I never used an acetate stencil. Right. Yeah, perfect like, example. That, that doesn't make me not a tattooer. Um, I mean, I I didn't even know that that was a thing until a few years into tattooing. Mm-hmm. Until I started seeing those. And I was like, oh my God, this is a relic to you know, collect, put on the wall. Like this is, this is cool that this is part of uh, a tradition, you know, this is not the way that I learned, but this is something that I want to hold on to and appreciate and learn from. Like, I mean, someone's probably going to do that with like needle cartridges at some point. They're going to have it like displayed, like those butterflies from the nineties. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like look at all these different cartridges you could have used. Yeah. (laughs) Look at this first generation iPad. Yeah. You you could draw on this fucking iPad. Holy <laughs> shit, that's amazing, man. They're going to have it framed on the wall. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, like whatever tattooing becomes and whoever gets in, the only thing that really matters is how the tattoo looks in 10, 15, 20 years after it settles in. Like, I think that's the real way to judge it. You know, like... Someone would say that I'm not doing traditional Japanese tattooing because I'm not doing tabori. And, you know, there's there's a million other reasons why I'm not a traditional Japanese tattooer. Like, that's the least of it, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really because you're from Charleston. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but, I mean, I can, I, I always, I always heard that, you know, like, you can't, you can't fake tabori. Like, it's, it, it's in there. It's, it is crammed in there at a level that you can't comprehend. Mm-hmm. And then I saw some stuff being done with rotary machines 15 years ago. I was like, that is, that is unbelievably saturated. I was like, I think I need to try a rotary, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's never only one way to, to do this. No, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, what, whatever it becomes, wherever it goes, it just seems like it keeps expanding. You know, there's going to be different genres of tattooing that we can't even conceive of yet where those people are only going to tattoo those people that appreciate that. Like I'm, I'm blown away that there's, um, that anime is a genre Mm. of tattooing. And there's people that are booked up for years only doing anime stuff I've never heard of. I've never conceived of, and they're booked as long as they want to be. And they're using bold lines, black shading, solid color. It's going to age well. So yeah, I mean, it's just going to keep morphing and turning into something else. And 
expanding on culture and expanding on pop culture and expanding on tradition and history. It's just going to go wherever it goes. Is anime tattooing the new like Tweety Bird tattoo, you think? Because it's like a pop culture image? No, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's, I mean, most people don't know anything about anime. Mm. Everyone knew what a Tweety Bird was. So That's true. at the moment, I don't know what's, what's going on in the world that's sort of as ubiquitous as uh, Looney Tunes characters were. What do you think? Well, in general, maybe this is a hot take that some people won't like. I don't like pop culture tattoos in general. Like what? Like, um, I mean, is there a line? Is there a definite year where you're like, I will not do anything past this year that's referencing pop culture? I mean, I'll do it. You draw a hard line at 1988? No, no, no. I do all sorts of stuff that I think is silly, but knowing that my taste isn't the only taste. But for my own taste, as far as tattoos go, like movie characters, uh, TV show references, uh, okay. like logos of things, just like pop culture shit that I guess my thought is that it's like, it's not timeless. Right. But I feel right. like you could poke holes into things that I like for similar reasons. And I haven't gone through the whole mental cartwheel to... Uh, talk myself in or out of this but just in general like pop culture stuff i don't like personally not that i won't do it i do like mo horror movie character sleeves and shit all the time for some reason they're actually kind of fun to do but right how how about um a gremlin is that pop culture or is that so old now that that's traditional and that's like a hole that you can poke in my what i'm saying here because i would feel that that's less pop culture but it's because that's like turned, I don't know. I can't reason through this. That's why I, I should have never said anything. I'm so stupid. I want to I want to work it out with you. I want to okay. figure it out. Let's figure it out. I'm trying to think what, okay, so. I mean, cause it's, I mean, that's like what I, what I referenced earlier. And I don't know if this is right, but you know, on a 20 year timeline, everything's traditional. Yeah, no, you're right. And I, I agree with that. Yeah. So, I mean, there's the modern day version of it, the clown. Yes. Clown movie. Mm -hmm. If you do that now, that's pop culture. If you do the one from the '80s, is that traditional? Right. And I think I would feel differently about the two for some reason. Yeah, because I guess if I had to rank it, if I had to pick one image that's at the top of my distaste for what I'm referring to as pop culture tattoos, I might say a portrait, a colored portrait tattoo of the Heath Ledger Joker. Oh, Jesus Christ. And it says, ha, 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 all around it in like weird colors. Even if, even if it's done impeccably, I can appreciate the technical application. And maybe it's also that style too, just pop culture colored portraits. For some reason, I just, it really makes me feel bad. It, it makes me feel a way as well. But is that the style? Um, I don't know. I mean... Maybe there is a Dan Higgs version of this that could work that would blow my mind, <laughs> but I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think no matter what year I see this happen, where it's a Heath Ledger Joker tattoo, I'll always hear his voice in my head from the movie because, mm -hmm. I don't know, I think it's kind of overrated. Well, maybe that makes a case for it being a timeless, important image. Yeah, I mean, if someone, if someone wanted me to do a Joker tattoo, you know, maybe, maybe I could show him a Hanya mask and I could say, <laughs> look, this thing sort of represents a lot of different facial features like the Joker had. Could I interest you in this <laughs> instead? I'd, I'd probably try to talk him out of it. They are both faces, okay? So we're already... We're already there. So let's just do, you know, if you think about it, a dragon, full body dragon is pretty similar to Heath Ledger in a lot of ways. His personality, you know, there are many facets to him. He also had four limbs. Correct. That'll get I'm, you there. I'm buying this. Yeah. No, that'll I'm get I'm buying this. I'm ready to get it. I'm ready to get it. <laughs> I'm ready I, to get the, <laughs> the Heath Ledger <laughs> face dragon back piece from you. Damn. I guess like a, I'm I sold. think I would prefer. You sold me. 
a pop culture image drawn almost shittily on purpose, I think is more interesting than like a really well done one. But maybe that's just my own taste. And maybe because it's like a fuck you to the, to the image itself. And that's why I like it. How about a Fred Durst QB? See now- Are we towing the line here of tradition and pop culture? Is it old enough to be pop culture? Now it's personal. Hit me. What do you got? I can't have an unbiased opinion about Fred Durst. Because? I think anything to do with Fred Durst is allowed because I love him. Do you? Unironically. So it's been my running joke on the show that he's going to be a guest on Books Closed because he's the most famous tattooer ever. It's true. I've been trying for years to get Fred Durst to do this podcast and he will not acknowledge me. Well, maybe one time, maybe one time he did acknowledge me and I was so close. I was so close. I've got faith in you. I think you can make this happen. I is believe that, in you. Is that a Limp Bizkit pun, Faith? Because they had that big song, Faith? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> but sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you know, I think you can always bet against me. I think that's a safe way to win anything is to bet against me. I saw Lincoln. Wait. I just called it Limp Biscuit. I saw Limp Biscuit on a third stage at a warp tour in 1996 mm-hmm. in Orlando, Florida. And we're like, what the hell is this? This is the worst band I've ever seen. It was pretty much like a parking lot stage, you know? It was like they had three stages and this was like the <laughs> shitty local band one. Yeah. And we were watching them play. I was like, this is the worst shit I've ever heard. <laughs> this will never leave this parking lot. <laughs> this this band dies here after this set right here. This is the worst shit I've ever seen. Uh, and and you were wrong. I was completely wrong. Yeah, I was completely wrong. Three years later, they're burning down Woodstock. Yeah, yeah. They came along at the perfect time for my age, where I was into Limp Bizkit as a kid, because they really got hot on MTV when I was eleven years old. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that would hit perfect. But I so was also- what year is that? That's like- So that was- What year are you 11? I was 11 in 2014. No, it was 1997. 97, you're 11. Okay, yeah. Yeah, one of, the, one of the first stories my wife ever told me we met in 2001 was uh, the Woodstock 99 story. She was there? Yeah. I mean, we were- we were old enough at this point, you know, to not even be remotely interested in like a pop culture MTV kind of thing. Right. So I was like, what were you doing at Woodstock? <laughs> She's like, oh, I was selling ice cream. I was like, oh, okay. Limp Biscuit told him to burn the whole thing down and we had to get rescued in like an ATV. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So we've been watching all the... um all the Woodstock documentaries this past year. Yeah, yeah, those are to, fun. Trying to find her in the background, like selling <laughs> ice cream, while all the people were raiding the car, stealing the ice cream, eating the dry ice, stealing Jesus the money. Jesus Christ. I would love to ask Fred Durst about that himself, but I just, you know, I haven't had the opportunity yet. You got to get him on. That's That would be amazing. So I've tried to go through so many avenues, and I've got stories that I haven't told on this podcast yet. Okay. Okay. And maybe I'll even cut I'll, maybe I'll even cut out what I'm about to say because I'm I'm saving it. I'm holding out for one day having the proper Fred Durst episode where I can have this whole story as part of it. But a couple summers ago, they were back on tour. They put out a new album. Mm-hmm. And they were they were coming through New Hampshire, like an hour away from Portsmouth. And so I bought tickets. I was gonna go. Because mm-hmm. at this point I had DM'd him on Instagram a lot of times <laughs> over a, a couple of years or more. I love it. And never got a response, of course, because he probably gets a lot of messages from random people. And I saw that he was reposting fan art. People were making fan art about him, about Limp Bizkit on their new tour. And he was reposting it to his story. So I thought, what's a better way to get in somebody's actual inbox and not just the requests on Instagram? I need him to acknowledge and repost my fan art. So I made fan art. I drew this, I drew a, thing on my iPad of Fred Durst. It was the summer he was like dressing up like an old man. There were like photos of it all over the internet. So I took one of those photos and drew drew Fred Durst as the old man, as a purple Grim Reaper. Okay. All right. (laughs) And I posted it. 
I put it on my story with okay. no explanation. And he fucking reposted it. No way. I was in. He put it on a story and then he sent me back like like lightning bolts or he like acknowledged it in the DM. And then so I, I played it cool. I didn't want to write him right back. So I waited like 23, 24 minutes and I sent a message and said, hey man. Make him wait. Yeah, make him fucking wait. Just like he had been making me wait for years. That's right. And I sent a message and I just said, hey, you're coming through New Hampshire. I'm going to be at the show. I'm a tattooer. If you or anyone on your band or your crew wants to get tattooed, let me know. I'll hook it up, bro. And he wrote me back like right away. And he said, do you do lettering? <laughs> Did he? He wrote me right back, said, do you do lettering? And I said, yep. And he's like, all right, cool. Like uh, he asked me some other questions about it. And then I sent him a couple photos of lettering tattoos I had done. And he's like, oh, okay, tight, cool. Well, you got like a, like a clean setup, like a travel setup or whatever. And I was like, yeah, for sure. And he's like, well, we're going to be, we're playing next Thursday, but then the day before we're staying in New Hampshire at this hotel, we're just going to be hanging out. If you want to come through, we can, we'll line up and then we'll, we'll, we'll make that happen. I'd love to get tattooed. And he was like super nice and super thankful. Oh, thank you so much for reaching out. I really appreciate it. It's very nice of you. And we were on, we had a date like uh, a little over a week after that. I was finally in and I figured he must have scrolled up and seen all the fucking like half drunk DMs I had sent to being like, man, I, you should, you really should be on my <laughs> podcast, man. You'd like, we'll talk about tattoos. It'll be sick. It'll be so cool. But he didn't acknowledge it. I didn't, I wasn't going to ask too much. I was going to get there. I was in my, I, in my head, I was going to charm him. We were going to be friends, best friends maybe. And then I, after tattooing him and having the best day ever, I could have said, hey, I make this podcast. Would you be willing if I pull out this recorder? If we just talk about tattoos for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And it would have been perfect. And then days later, their whole tour got, the rest of their tour got canceled because the guitar player got COVID. And so they didn't, and none of it happened. It all fell through. That stupid bastard. So pissed. And so since then, God, I've just been striking out. You're so out. close. You're so well, close. Because I put it out on so many episodes like, hey, if anyone knows Fred Durst, if anyone knows how to get a message to Fred Durst, please help me facilitate this. This is serious. I didn't know it was like this, dude. Yes. So I've referenced it on the show so many times that I was hoping it would just like get back to him so many times where he'd be like, all right, I'll fuck, let's do it. He's more interesting now to me, you know, what, it, what it's like 30 years after they came out, after I saw him in a, in an Orlando parking lot. Yeah. I saw, I saw this accidental clip of them on Instagram yesterday. Mm -hmm. And he was dressed up like, like a Garth Brooks, like yes, like a Western shirt tucked in, belt saw buckle, that too. cowboy yeah. boots, like, like some real like Sears Wrangler type jeans, cowboy hat, and <laughs> it looked it looked accurate. And I was like, who the hell is this guy? Is I, I guess all of it's just you know costumes that he he's wears. Yeah, it, it, he's he's really leaning into the cosplay angle. It's like every time they go out and do these these tours, he's a new character. That seems fun. Do you remember uh, a old website called Buddyhead? I don't think so. It was it was connected to like punk and hardcore somehow. Like I didn't have the internet at the time, but friends did, and they were showing it to me. And um, there was this thing where it was like people from maybe Ink and Dagger ran Buddyhead. And they were breaking into his office and wearing his hats and taking photos of it and putting his home phone number online. <laughs> they were doxing Fred Durst in oh 1999. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they did it. You know, it was like the vampire punk kids like wearing like backwards red hats and they had broken into the office. They had infiltrated Fred Durst. That's amazing. Did he do the HIV tattoo on the corn guy? <laughs> I don't think so. You know what but, I'm talking about? Oh, I know what you're talking about. I remember looking at that in a as you're talking about Fred Durst in, <laughs> yeah. in the 90s that, that just like was in the back of my brain somewhere that I was looking in some tattoo magazine and it had Jonathan Davis showing his HIV tattoo <laughs> that was very poorly done. Yes. Maybe that was it. I guess it's possible. It's possible he did do that, but I, I don't know. I know that he tattooed the guitar player of Limp Bizkit. He has like a pretty sizable tattoo on one of his upper arms. Kind of what you'd expect, like graffiti inspired, new school kind of yeah, like yeah, yeah. stuff yeah. that would have been embroidered on, big on the back of a Jinko jeans pocket or something. Mm, mm, beautiful. So, so that was his jam. Maybe that's how you could get him. You could, um, you could get in touch and tell him that you're the Florida Health Department. 
<laughs> and you need to talk to him about something. <laughs> he's, he's late on some of his fees. Yeah, all of his old clients died in the same day and he needs to answer to it. There you go. That's how to get him. That's how to get him. You could be wearing the Joker nurse outfit. <laughs> <laughs> and you turn around, <laughs> you've got the <laughs> Well, let me ask you gotcha, this, Gotcha, Fred Durst. Yeah, motherfucker. Would you rather have- Sit the fuck down, Fred. <laughs> would you rather have <laughs> the Heath Ledger Joker portrait or the Jonathan Davis HIV tattoo? Um, I mean, this is an I, clear, a clear answer. <laughs> this is terrible. This is terrible. The, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the Jonathan Davis tattoo. Really? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Holy yeah. fuck! It's traditional at this point, you know. You might dislike pop culture tattoos more than me with that answer. Well, do you know his reasoning or why he says he has that HIV tattoo? No. Do you? Well, I've read in interviews that growing up, he was ridiculed by like jock types so much and they would say you're gay you're okay. you know all the um, words all the words that were used in the 80s and 90s that nobody thought twice about and so he thought right. what's what's the biggest like na 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 tattoo to get to acknowledge the people who were ridiculing him and he got HIV tattooed on his arm because that's the logical okay that's the logical way to symbolize that that's the only tattoo that I know that he has on him for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if he has if he has other. No, I I think he must have others. But I don't know. That one really stands out. That's a good way to get tattoos is just trying to do the na 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 na. Yeah. Which is funny because it's kind of That's him like them. standing up against that that kind of ridicule, but isn't it more homophobic to be like, well, what's the most closely associated thing to being gay is HIV? Right. <laughs> <laughs> like he he really he really missed you know like that's kind of like the tone deaf sure response did. to that that's like a Michael Scott uh, 100%. response. <laughs> well, we better get out of here because uh, we have dinner reservations in about ten minutes. So uh, let's wrap this thing up. Let's eat. Let's eat, my friend. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, that was a fun one. Thank you to Zach Spurlock for sitting down with me to do this episode. And thank you to you for sticking it out through another episode of Books Closed. Did you hear any Savannah ghosts in the background of that interview? Ooh. Yeah, I didn't either. For more information about the show, check out booksclosedpodcast.com. You can find all past episodes, videos, audios, photos, informations, all of it. Booksclosedpodcast.com. Pick up some merch for you or for a loved one this holiday season. Thank you to my sponsors from this episode, Black Dagger Books, DOS M, Tattoo Dream, and Equal Vision Records. You guys are all the bomb. And I'll be back next time. We'll do this all over again with a new guest, maybe a new topic, maybe both. See you then. <laughs> <laughs>